Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, or I guess I should say good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the School of Public Policy today. Um, I am going to turn over the ceremony to uh, Professor Tom Hildy, who is the director of our Indonesia program, to introduce our guest. But I can't help but take the opportunity to say a word myself, as I have had the pleasure over many years to work with uh, Pa Rahmat. Uh, and I'd like to welcome both Pa Rahmat and pa Ibu Irna um, today. Um, this uh, subject couldn't be more important, uh, but uh, you may not realize what a privilege it is to have our guest today. He has been instrumental at, uh, quite frankly, every twist and turn of global climate policy uh, in the last uh, couple decades. Um, personally, uh, I had the pleasure of witnessing his leadership at the Conference of Parties in Bali that was the starting point for the entire process that led to the Paris Agreement. Uh, and in that, it may be no surprise to many of you who study the subject, uh, it was not an easy beginning. And as the president of the Conference of Parties, uh, Pa Rahmat was able to navigate the global politics, the national politics, and I would say to open the space for all of the actors that we needed to become a part of the climate process so that the governments would feel the, the pressure to be able to uh, uh, launch a climate process and a climate negotiation that culminated in Paris. So we have uh, one of the original architects of that process, the author of the Bali roadmap that Okay, I, he, he thinks I'm exaggerating. I'm actually understating his role. So uh, with that, let me ask uh, Professor Hildy to interest, introduce our guest today. Uh, thank you, Dean Orr. That, uh, that was a nice introduction in itself, so I'll be very brief. Um, uh, welcome to uh, Pak Rahmat, Ibu Erna. I'd also like to welcome Amanda Katili and Titi Rezdiana. Uh, part of the team from Indonesia. Um, I I've, I've, haven't known uh, Pak Rahmat and Amanda and Titi uh, as long as Bob has, uh, but I can say for the past eight years I've been taking a group of students to Indonesia every year. Um, and I think everyone comes back from that course uh, uh, with a sense of wow. Um, one, of, one of the former grad assistants for that course calls Indonesia the most interesting country in the world, and I have to agree with it. It's, it's a fascinating place, 17,000 islands trying to hold themselves together into one country. Uh, it is a place with the, it is the fourth largest country in the world. It has the third largest tropical rainforest of the three great remaining tropical rainforests, and that is one of the key parts of the, the issue of climate change for Indonesia is deforestation, land use change, and so on, is conserving these forests. And uh, as Bob has said, Pak Rahmat has been instrumental in this process in Indonesia, but it's an ongoing one. It involves the oil palm industry, it involves pulp and paper, it involves companies, it involves small farmers, it involves policy, a number of different actors which Pak Rahmat will be speaking about today. Uh, one final note, I'd like to thank uh, the Center for Global Sustainability and Nate Holtman for co-sponsoring along with CISM, the Center for International Security Studies here, and the School of Public Policy itself. Um, Pak Rahmat. Again, I'd like to express my appreciation for giving me that, uh, the chance to talk to you. Like uh, Thomas said, we've been meeting regularly over the years, but now I'm, this is the first time I come here, and I took a tour around your beautiful campus, although not very intended because my driver lost his uh, GPS. <laughs> so we had to, we had to Converse uh, 
with uh, how to get here. But anyway, I'm glad to be here, and I hope that we can have uh, a productive uh, meeting today. Uh, I've uh, prepared the uh, talking points and, and some slides, but essentially I'd like to uh, to be in a dialogue with you because upstairs, Bob had told me that uh, the esteemed distinguished audience are much younger than I am and certainly much smarter because I come from the old school. I have history, but I want we have to look forward. So I hope that uh, today, with my introduction and problem statements, I would like to hear in a dialogue form with uh, all of you, time permitting, and maybe take, uh, take away uh, some uh, insights into their problems. So first of all, we have this uh, title of the of what we're going to talk about: the climate policies, which uh, focus on deforestation and the non-state actors. Maybe some background of Indonesia, which may be not very important, but uh, it, is, it sets the context of the problem. Indonesia is, like it like was said, it is uh, the seventh largest economy in the world. It is um, a, a member of the G20 now, and uh, we are still struggling to pursue our goal to have a, a, a national growth of 5%. Having said that, at the same time, we are suffering under the, uh, under the want of uh, giving a, a better livelihood for 27.7 .7 million of my country people who are living under $1 per day, which is a great homework. So that is the background of we are, we are a big country. 17,000 islands. As now we have named 8,000 of them because the other ones we run out of names and maybe some <laughs> we give them numbers but no names. I don't know. I don't know. It's, a, it's a big task. And the problems there are very numerous and very complex, certainly, because we cannot have an electricity, electricity grid for one. 17,000 islands cannot be. Uh, a big uh, power generator to distribute them, which is very, very particular. For that purpose, our uh, current president is uh, very aware of that, and the, his building <coughs> on, the, uh, on the problems, on the very real problems coming from the grassroots, because uh, we can study and we can design strategies, but if it's not uh, derived from the grassroots, it will not be executed. So, and uh, well, there's a characteristic of the president he is very uh, is very active in um, entertaining all the uh, problems in this in the in the uh, provinces because he was a, a, a mayor himself a few years ago. And for a status, and he made for that purpose. <clears throat> of course, uh, we have asked him to give guidelines or to, or to uh, directives, present directives, and for that purpose, directives to ensure the alignment of sustainable development. We have some goals, and the, the major ones that actually, in the context of this talk, is to restore the grid conservation areas of 100,000 hectares by 2019, two years from now, and to reduce critical land area to rehabilitation of 5 million hectares within the forestry recruitment and watershed priorities until 2019. This will <coughs> help Indonesia to achieve its, its, its uh, sustainability. Uh, uh, dear audience, <clears throat> so Indonesia is aware that it is one uh, one of the countries with the most biodiverse and forest areas of planet, and that is a uh, responsibility as well as uh, a blessing 
because um, we have to develop it in uh, as a developing as a different uh, strategy, but we have to maintain it. So we are uh, we are um, responsible. We can be made responsible for the the today's uh, great uh, challenge, which is the climate change, and the main drivers of this is deforestation. So the main drivers of deforestation in Indonesia is not to be coming from agriculture and forestry activities. In the last decades, last parts of the Indonesian rainforest have been converted into monoculture palm oil plantations and logging areas, which is actually a strategic mistake if we look back, but it was uh, appropriate for the decision at this time. And this, then industries in, in that area is uh, being accused for the annual forest and land fires. The most devastating <coughs> land fires occurred in 2015, which is uh, two years ago which burned an area four and a half times the size of Bali, costing 16.1 billion and causing major health issues for the inhabitants of the region. There's a big chunk of area, which is maybe as large, maybe larger than Holland, probably. And it emits a huge amount of greenhouse gases amounting to two million tons of carbon dioxide occurring in 2.6 million hectares, 30%, around 40% in peatlands and 61% in non-peatlands. And for <clears throat> those who are aware of these problems, the <clears throat> peatland situation is a major headache because it was a historical mistake from the previous president, I mean, not previous, one, one of the numbers, President Suharto, that's the, the second president. Because uh, it was, we were not aware that uh, sustainability and climate change and the forest can be uh, probably, probably problematical. But that time, they were chasing revenue and, and a large area of, uh, of the largest um, Island and in Indonesia, Kalimantan, uh, he started to cultivate uh, paddies for price, a million hectares, but it was uh, rent with corruption and low technology, so it became a wasteland and, and it became peatlands, and it's the major source of emissions from that on, which is in, in the 80s, 90s, until today. And uh, uh, later I would explain how we try to compensate for that. And <clears throat> it caused uh, certainly um, a lot of headaches for the FN of this. It is difficult for Indonesia to achieve its greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets if these forests and fires remain recurrent. The increasing forest and land fires have furthered the campaign against Indonesian palm oil and pulp wood products because it is very easy to connect this palm oil and pulp wood certainly is uh, the direct uh, result or direct product of forests. And that is because it is a bad way but the question arises that uh, they are the ultimate or the biggest uh, culprits of that. But I would argue that is it true that all oh, in recent palm oil and pulp wood companies are the bad. We recognize that some of them are bad, some of them are not so bad, and some of them are, are okay. And that uh, brings us to a discussion later. The Indonesian palm oil and pulp wood story is a complex one with international and national politics, corporate businesses, and agricultural interests all playing a role, and sustainable development, economic prosperity, and climate change all being at stake. So Indonesia does have a high economic dependency on the palm oil industry from the export revenues because it is, 
it is a big chunk of our export revenues. And, but of course, another factor is that it provides jobs to millions or millions of people who are not very well educated and who are in the, in the, in the outlying areas. Another factor of this controversy of the, is the palm oil story, is that compared to other vegetable oils such as canola, soybean, sunflower, and rapeseed, palm oil is more efficient in generating, generating incomes from limited land and yield per hectare bigger, higher than other vegetable oils. It is also easier and cheaper for manufacturers to extract and process the oil into a wide variety of products, such as food products, cosmetics, medicines, biodiesel, etc. It has been said that uh, 80 uh, spin-offs of the uh, palm oil, palm oil uh, palm plant can, is, can be harvested. And I'm, I'm not a palm oil farmer, but I've been, uh, I've been uh, given the uh, information to counter the, some of the uh, misunderstandings, which some of them are not misunderstandings, but opinions of course people. Uh, that people are free to have their opinions, but uh, they are not free to, uh, to start from misunderstanding. So I would like, uh, I, I, I am in the, in, the, uh, in the task of trying to gain understanding from all the support or, or are against this palm oil, palm oil. So the question is, is the only reason to ban palm oil an environmental one? Or does other factor play a role? Such as a trade war that is uh, a very offensive uh, question, actually. But I witnessed that uh, because Indonesia is the biggest uh, palm oil producer, a far distance from Malaysia. And the trade war is starting, and sometimes it is not, uh, just not reasonable because f uh, I witnessed the, the ones who are against palm oil are uh, producing some uh, misinformation that palm oil is, uh, is uh, the industry is run, is uh, employs other eight children and all that. After that is cleared, that it is uh, that it is uh, not healthy and all that. So the question is, do these other factors play a role, such as or is it trade war? But we realize all that. So industry uh, under, under with the fact that the industry does have a major contribution to the national economy, with 12 percent of the national exports. And so we have the Indonesian government tries to make this position in a sustainable way. So no, there are no lies around that, but we, we cannot uh, do it in, the, in, the, in, in a non-sustainable manner. To do that, we is have uh, founded climate policies, and we have to do, uh, to make public policies that can address all the precious uh, risk concerns of the of the world, and this is a very hard task because we do recognize, like to say, introduced by Bob, that we are very committed to the effort to mitigate on climate change. It is a significant significant part of our country to reach this unconditional greenhouse gases and we have uh, committed ourselves to 26 to have an uh, emission reduction target 26 percent with a condition of 41 percent condition by 2020 compared to business as usual projected emissions we are halfway there but of course, after the Paris uh, Agreement, we have recalculated, 
in, the, uh, in our INDC, then we have calculated we can have a emission cut of 29% emissions reduction and a conditional of 41%. Uh, speaking as an, someone from inside the system, I would like to state that uh, this is not a too ambitious project, it is a hard project because the forest fires and the ignorance of people within is still working towards that. People are still uh, not uh, taking care of the waste, not taking care of the energy uh, potentials. But uh, we have, uh, the numbers are still on, on track. It, we have reviewed it and I hope we can do that. Compared to other countries, it is in the upper middle because, uh, of course, the uh, northern European countries are in the extreme high. They have 50 percent to 100 percent of uh, the reduction, which is not not possible for forested countries or for big countries like Indonesia. But it is uh, something that uh, to aim for. Maybe given time, Indonesia can also do that. The U.S. is in the same position with the new policies. I hope it does not change the uh, the attitude the, the attitude that has been discussed within the UNFCCC during this decade, where Bob was there and myself. There are some changes I understand, but of course that is the dynamics of uh, international international uh, uh, interactions. We should understand that uh, that should that will uh, come to rest because uh, the uh, problem is still there. Whatever we talk about, however we talk about that, the problem is there. Climate change is threatening all of us, and nobody can do it by themselves. We have to work together. The the current condition of the oil plantations still has an impact on the environment biodiversity and health. Although the enactment of regulation on the moratorium in 2015, so the rate of deforestation has decreased and there are still parties who do deforestation or land clearing by burning. So there. This deforestation leads to many irreversible problems. As many concessions are in the habitat of areas with high conservation values and on peatlands, so they have been they were there all along. These problems include carbon emissions are rising sharply, loss of forests with high conservation areas are endemic, and endemic animal habitat, loss of benefits of peatlands to absorb carbon, as well as an increase in the possibility of greenhouse gas emissions with or without fire occurrences due to drain peatlands, which I talk about, to provide optimal results. The disappearance of some customary law communities who have lived in the forest since hundreds of years ago is also a problem. Responding to all of that, the Indonesian government has implemented some strict measures for the way forward. Some ways to move forward are as follows. We have to improve the governance of the various stakeholders including national and local governments, as well as the palm oil and plywood companies. Increase productivity through research and innovation, because with, even without the land clearing or uh, extending the, the, uh, the, uh, the areas, we can increase the, increase the products. So we have reduced the expansion by moratorium. And one of the other particular items is the peatland restoration. Data availability and transparency for monitoring and inflation to increase public trust is very important and we are working together with other institutions and countries. One of the inherent problems in this is to resolve the land tenure conflicts by quickly implementing the one map policy. Indonesia as a growing country has a problem with this one map policy because 
we have a glass country, which does not mean we have to have several maps. We have to have one map that says what it is. But we have been victim to the situation that there are some uh, maps, both of them claiming to be the map, and it is very controversial. And that one of the first things that uh, have to be is is one map policy. And we are working even with your government, the American of USA, in doing that. And this is one of the major major products that will come maybe within the next few years. And we have, are going into certification of the sustainable palm oil standard, round table on the sustainable palm oil, companies from big companies and state-owned companies. And we have to have inclusive regulation, such as we have to work from the bottom up there, better management of forest fires, which is actually a misnomer because we don't want forest fires, but if there is forest fire, we have to manage it. I mean, every country has forest fires. Uh, New Zealand, if you ask, California, everybody has forest fires. We have all forest fires, and like I said, 2015 was very bad, and that gives a very uh, awkward situation with our neighbors, uh, in particular, Singapore, Singapore student here, and in particular because the forest, because of the season in September, just last week, is a high risk time where the Singapore people, they have a F1 uh, race. So they are very offended if we give, we export uh, haze. Of course, we, we don't export it, it just happens. But in 2015, there was almost a, a war of words, at least, that uh, we are not doing it, but it, we are also victims because the first victims of forest fires are the people around that, the children around that. The schools are closed. Well, Singapore, well, it's important that there's a Formula One race, but it is, it is less important. So we have to have an integrated communication to inform about all this. And I'm very happy that we are here. I can listen and learn from the experience and the knowledge of those present here, because uh, I'm too busy in trying to go into the science. I just listen to what uh, the IPCC and the other scientists are saying, including yourselves from the school. Uh, but then, as a closing remarks, maybe we in Indonesia is committed to transform the agriculture and the forestry sectors to a more sustainable practice, which can improve the quality of lives without harming the environment. It's a very noble objective, of course. The national government has taken both measures, such as the presidential decree on moratorium on peatlands, the creation of peatland restoration agency, punishing the companies building the forests and peatlands and engaging companies to work together to prevent forest fires and increase productivity of smallholders and raise their standards for certification. There are many positive alternatives to be found in Indonesia that show that it is possible to manage our forest and land in a more sustainable manner without creating further deforestation. But to achieve these goals, it needs collaboration and efforts from all stakeholders. Thank you for your time. Oh, yes, of course, yeah, that's why. Uh, so we'll take some questions. Clay Ramsey at SISM here. Um, I wonder whether the... Um, Excuse me, I didn't hear your name. Clay, Clay. Ramsey. Okay. Um, I wonder if you could tell me whether the um, customary weather patterns of Indonesia, particularly concerning um, 
levels of temperature in summer and fall and rainfall levels, um, are they, they showing, are they showing changes that, that leads to a discussion as to whether these changes can be ascribed to climate change, and if so, how much? I think I just have a direct answer. Yes, it does, but not as extreme as you have in the tropical or the northern countries. No big hurricanes or tornadoes, but there's a shifting of the weather patterns, which is being a large extended country, it is very uh, damaging kind of for the production of, uh, of the agriculture, so agriculture. Because uh, in the uh, traditional um, rice growing areas, they look at birds flying, the sun shining as well, they plant. But now it does not happen. And you can see uh, that uh, certain planting seasons now are, uh, are uh, imposed upon them to plant in non non conducive times. So there is a weather patterns, and it is being uh, mapped with the, the maps that we have, and we're working with uh, the IPCC and FCCC about the weather patterns. So we can introduce. Uh, the change as, as close as possible to, to the, pre, uh, pre, uh, the previous scan. The problem is that uh, agricultural culture in Indonesia is still traditional and it has to have a very good communication network which we don't have at this moment. So some of them, they are at a loss why their, their rice or their plants do not uh, produce us. So we have to do the, not uh, casting blame on each other. On the, uh, on the national uh, effort is to try to get uh, um, seeds, uh, seeds and uh, weather, weather resistant seeds because with the changing weather, some of them have gone into the Planting of uh, rice as traditionally has to be a uh, submerged kind of, but that there's an, uh, the, the uh, uh, research of, uh, of planting, we, we, we are doing that. And uh, we have neighboring countries, they are also doing that. The most uh, famous is the, uh, the Philippines and maybe in Thailand. But uh, they don't have the same problem as we are because we are so extended for uh, as large as the U.S. and <laughs> with a lot of uh, seas in between. So we, the weather, we are very vulnerable to this. And that is why I'm always uh, uh, calling attention to the developing, developed nations to give us the necessary technology understanding how we can overcome that. Because the weather is, of course, only wet and dry. But now we have wet, dry season and dry, wet season, so it's a bit confusing. Thank you for your question. Yes. yes. Jim Riker. Jim Riker. My question is, what can Indonesia teach the world, then, when it comes to its uh, best practice, best policies that might be valuable to other nations that are struggling with the same choices. What can you teach, say, Brazil or Malaysia or other countries that face the deforestation issue and are facing, of course, imminent climate change challenges? What do you think are the best lessons that Indonesia offers the world? Thank you, sir. I think uh, we cannot say that we are giving the best, uh, the best lessons. We have... Uh, South-to-south uh, -south cooperation, where we exchange uh, both uh, expertise and tech tech technologies. But then again, Indonesia is uh, only this, uh, only similar to uh, Philippines kind of archipelago. We have 7,000, 17,000 islands. They have maybe three, four thousand. So it's similar. We cannot uh, really uh, introduce our uh, 
uh, best practices with those landlocked view. But the principle of, of, the, of the idea is that we have to work from the uh, participation of the people in, the, in those affected. And that is uh, a very hard lesson for Indonesia itself, because it used to be with an autocratic uh, government, which was in the uh, prior to 2000, in the Suharto uh, era, because of the uh, of the hurry that we want to increase, we give formulations, solutions to the people at, in, in the in the outlying areas, which is actually not uh, not proper. We send tractors all over the, all over the place, whilst in a, an island, you don't use tractors. They use uh, small sampans. You cannot have uh, gasoline to to run the tractors. So the best, uh, call, call it the advice to our neighbors out of similar situations, it is to listen to the people. And now I think we are in the process of doing that at the expense that the central government, the president is uh, being treated uh, day and night for all the suggestions that he would include in the presidential decree. This presidential decree that is issued just uh, a few months ago is a product of, uh, call it, uh, the interaction between the people at large and the government, uh, the local government, or the subnational governments. So I think Brazil has, is more advanced because they are, uh, call it maybe easier to handle because they, you can drive a car all across Brazil. So they have solutions particular to them. And, but uh, we have similarities and, uh, and differences. So that is the fact of life. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jordan Bear. Um, in these peatland and um, rainforest areas, what tools are you using to educate or incentivize citizens to, you know, abandon these destructive practices of farming and um, forestry? Thank you. Well, uh, that's also one uh, situation where uh, understanding of what's going on in these areas is very important. Because uh, there is a law, a traditional law and a long-standing law, that land clearing for those who cannot do their purchase can be done by um, burning, burning the land, by burning the, uh, burning the where they're going to plant. Because there's no other way. And that was, uh, 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 misunderstood or made use, made use of by the present corporation by uh, using that land because that one uh, for one landowner of two hectares can do that. So we have two 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 uh, guys doing that four hectares. That for, we have uh, two hundred uh, that is four hundred hectares. We have uh, ten thousand that so, and the corporations at that time they made use of that because it's the cheapest way to clear land. Now there is a very strong uh, rule, law against that. But the law is still there. So it, it needs some legislation because the people still point at that law. So that the legislation and the policies are still in, 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 in an antagonistic position. But uh, to overcome that, uh, and the Peterns in particular, uh, the president has uh, created this uh, uh, land, peatland restoration agency headed by a presidential nominee that, has, that is in charge of everything from education, uh, edu 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 education and uh, uh, empowering people and funding and all the technologies. So we try, uh, uh, we try with uh, 500,000 hectares. We have we have 15 million uh, peatland areas, but not all of them are at risk. But those at risk, uh, two million of them are at risk, and we are uh, doing that by 
um, special agency for that. Plus, the understanding of the uh, residents, uh, Bupati, right? regions of the of the regions, for them to come to close because the arms of the central government of the ministry cannot reach that far. It is a slow process, but uh, we are happy that uh, the younger people with their uh, uh, Facebook and Twitter help us in doing that. Don't do this, don't do that. And so it, it is a generation, generational education process where the younger can teach the elders because the elders stick to the former uh, disciplines where time since it was not there, it is there, but they don't know that. But now the younger uh, uh, people, the younger persons, they are very much uh, receptive, very much aware of that. So uh, even myself, I'm like uh, Bob has been saying, I'm a promoter of climate change. I've always my my uh, uh, grandchild says, "Okay, don't throw that away. It's, it is uh, not <laughs> so I have to just pocket any waste." <laughs> so. so my point is that as a generation interaction within the generation and also in the countryside for the, uh, the more traditional people to be informed uh, by the younger, by their uh, offspring, which is in the Indonesian context, it is impolite if a younger person says, uh, gives an advice to an elder person, but we are changing that because it is, we have to fight climate change. <laughs> Thank you. Is that? Uh, Who are you and where are you from? I'm uh, Lucy Chu, and I'm working at the Pub uh, School of Public Policy. I'm originally from China. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that the majority uh, or significant part of the uh, palm oil product produced in Indonesia is exported to other countries. So essentially these other countries, they are consuming palm oil but not paying for the cost of uh, deforestation and also carbon emissions that happen in Indonesia. So essentially Indonesia is, per is basically uh, paying for all the costs associated with deforestation and carbon emissions due to palm oil production. So I was wondering if there are any discussions going on uh, of the Indonesia government to take any um, actions or policies to deal with this virtual carbon uh, issues in international trading. Thank you. Yes, there is. There is an agency that uh, has this and it's uh, called the well, agency for that, uh, BPDP. And it is uh, coordinating all the efforts of the uh, palm oil, uh, palm oil uh, industry, vis-à-vis -vis the complaints and the requests of the uh, users, in particular in in Europe, because uh, the facts that I mentioned was uh, uh, the palm oil uh, products is. Uh, very much present in Europe and maybe in the US, but US has also their own. It is, uh, we're trying to have a win-win situation. But it became last year, no, a few months ago, it became politicized because they're uh, using the European Parliament to try to impose a moratorium on palm oil products. But since uh, I know the picture, it is not very well uh, taken by us. We ask the governments, not the, the European, because the European, Union, European Parliament is not a national parliament. They can say whatever they want, but sometimes in, 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 uh, not in agreement with the government, government of the national government itself. So we deal with the government and we listen to each and every government in Europe or anywhere else, but not in this particular case, not to the European Parliament. And uh, we have uh, um, delegations going there. Well, I'm not part of it because I'm not uh, tasked to do that. I just uh, inform my colleagues that they have to be careful if it is politicized. The, first, the best thing is not to counter-politicize, but 
took effects. Like I said, it is, uh, it is uh, too much cholesterol. Well, I think that margarine is less cholesterol than butter. And I also put the, the medical aspects of that is, uh, is, already, uh, is already answered. But about the price, the price of, of uh, what is the products of the palm oil is very competitive because it is a large economic scale. Now to overcome that, we are trying to, uh, to have a different strategy. We will not uh, depend on the export, uh, uh, export finance, export um, uh, incomes. But we are going to use that in, as a biofuel because that we, we need fuel and all uh, fossil fuel, fossil fuel, first of all, is damaging. The second is running out. So we have to uh, use a biofuel. And this uh, palm oil is very perfect for that. So at one moment, maybe we don't export it to the, maybe to the uh, detriment of the French people because their croissants will taste different. Well, this is their problem. <laughs> it is said that the, 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 in, in, in the European Parliament, it is the friends that, uh, that defend palm oil because the palm oil, the palm oil itself is a major component for croissants to rise up and to be very <laughs> direct. Otherwise, it will fall flat. They cannot uh, be, have sunflower seed or mefo or otherwise. But anyway, we realize that we are not, uh, we are not uh, going up that way. We know that we can, first of all, uh, with the moratorium, not expand. The second with new technologies to increase the production and use production as biofuel to compensate for the fossil fuels, which is, which is uh, very bad for the climate. So we try to do all that, and we have formulas for that. Well, thank you. Yes, Nat. Well, thank you for that uh, overview of, of Indonesia's uh, approach to climate change, and in particular, your, your next steps, your way forward was clearly taking a comprehensive view of how to kind of integrate a lot of the, the concerns that, that have, uh, you raised about how to balance multiple uh, issues confronting both Indonesia and the world. Um, I wanted to, to take a little bit of a deeper dive into one particular area you talked about, which is how you were engaging with these different non-state actors, the different groups that you mentioned a couple of times um, in your talk and also the Q&A. And I wonder just, have you seen um, any significant change in how much those non-state actors have been involved with discussions uh, with the government, uh, both on the kind of NGO side and also on the corporate side? Um, in advance of and then after Paris, as you were sort of thinking about your overall comprehensive strategy and how that how that sort of has changed or affected the way that the, the strategy has been uh, conceived and implemented. Okay, thank you, Len. That's a very deep question. <laughs> well, we realized all that, and I think as I speak, uh, are the preparations for this uh, next COP includes very much the non-state actors and the companies. But for the companies itself, like you asked with this, because the first reason and non-state actors is the companies itself, among others, and academia and all that. Uh, we are giving them more uh, access to decision making. And for that purpose, even I'm instrumental to that, I have, I have regular focus group decisions led by TT and Manda and all my staff. And every, every time any scholar comes in, uh, we introduce them, bring along the, the companies and the other academia. And we, ha we are on our way in mainstreaming that sustainable development thing into the perfect orientation of the companies. Because uh, we surely realize, it is realized that if there's no uh, 
companies, you know, corporations, then where do you tax the people? I mean, there's no money. We have to sell whatever it is, comes on the ground, which is stopping there anyway. So for that purpose, uh, we, we are doing, the, 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 doing a system that includes all that. And uh, even a very, very opportune that from Baltimore angling to Washington and talk to those very people in the U USA, Indonesian, you see no, you see no, to how to place the uh, state, the, the non-state actors, the companies, the product productions into the context of the efforts to give them room to grow, but also to adhere to the uh, necessity of uh, good governance. Was that your question? Okay, thank you. But then again, uh, I do need the uh, power of the information society, and starting from the something from the universities, which I uh, often visit, including this. <laughs> I hope that those bring with them messages, positive messages, and, and also critics to to us, to myself. I mean, maybe you you are polite enough not to pamper you with. <laughs> <laughs> Please go ahead. I mean, I, I mean, feel free to, to give me some uh, kind of critics and some uh, messages to give to the to the president, because he's the executor. I, I'll tell him things, but uh, he does the things. Like yes, yes. Uh, two days ago, I was Bob was also there in the UN. We wrote out uh, our opinions on this, and it is. Uh, it falls into that category that we are uh, uh, we are uh, responding to the needs of the corporations, but the corporations has to respond to the efforts to clamp down climate change. So that's what we do. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's two of them. Miss, miss. Um, hello, sir. Uh, thank you for coming to our what? school. Uh, my name is Andrea. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Uh, I'm a second year in the master's in public policy, and I come from Colombia. Uh, my country is right now committing to zero deforestation in the Amazon, and I think it sees Indonesia as a leader on this. But also, uh, I have <laughs> one of these critics. I have seen in the news about the program RED and how, how RED Plus has worked in, in Indonesia. So I want to know what are the biggest challenges for a country that is going to commit on this program and if there are some changes that should be uh, done in the, to this program. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the question. I think uh, Colombia and Indonesia, they share the same problems, Puerto Rico, Brazil, and well, with the red, which is in, in Bali at the time, we try to, uh, to, to handle the problems with, in, with the forest, inclusive of the people who live in there. And this, it is not a command situation. It is an educational and persuasive situation. And giving opportunities and compensation for those who are who are not uh, who are being victimized by the new regulations? Because in Indonesia, like I mentioned, people at well without any further thought, they can cut down branches for cooking or uh, burning land for planting because they need to do so. That is why Indonesia, helped by international community, is giving assistance to them for that to assist the rest. So what, is, uh, what does REDD needs? It needs more intensive effort and more time. Because we, we have this policies in, in place, but it's over, overcome by the, by the need of the climate change pressure and those who have to gain a living from the forests. Okay, thank you. There's another one you want to see? The site, the site. Oh, you were there talking with me. 
Selamat siang Pak Rahmat. Uh, I'm Muhtar. Uh, now we have Paris Agreement, but before we have Kyoto Protocol, right? Uh, I want to know, and I'm wondering how effective is Kyoto Protocol implemented in Indonesia, particularly, and also how Indonesian government uh, implemented Kyoto Protocol in order to face the climate change issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Ade <laughs> Mokhtar. I think we are very committed, uh, judging from the political uh, aspects. We states, we hosted the Conference of Parties. There's a very big commitment because uh, it is expensive to hold a 12,000 or 15,000 meeting, whilst people are still have no electricity. But because looking at the long range goal, we are committed to doing that and we have uh, produced something that is until now one of the major decisions that made. So this commitment is now uh, uh, being aimed also inwards into the Indonesian uh, society by favor of the, uh, the regulations of the ministry, ministries in particular the Ministry of uh, Planning, the BAPNAS. So the BAPNAS has uh, given uh, directions to for, for, doing, for doing and not doing the do's and don'ts of uh, industry, of building. They are in charge of that. The, 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 uh, what the Ministry of Environment can do, what the Ministry of, of uh, of uh, energy can do, when they say agriculture, it is all in 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 the province of, of design of the uh, of the minister of uh, Babnas, by with the assistance of the academia and the, and the people in 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 the, in the uh, outlying islands, and that is uh, that is coming into the top of the government with Pak Jokowi. That is why he made a very big effort to come to Paris to commit Indonesia and to make further designs to pursue that commitment. And that is why just yesterday we have again reconfirmed our, uh, our support, our appreciation for the, for the Paris Agreement. And we are uh, uh, following the NDCs, the National Determined uh, contributions to the letter and trying to to make our uh, our uh, energy policies work and in particular one of the major uh, major um, major points of uh, of I mentioned the towns townships to be better townships for land clearing and for transportation so that's the whole picture we are trying to move forward together and we hope that we have time for that. Thank you, Mota. What are you studying here? Uh, MBA. M oh. uh, I'm an MBA student. Okay, good. Well, please come back and teach us more. <laughs> we, have, we have time for one more. Still. Uh, my question is regarding to the small land uh, holders because the small? Uh, the small land holders oh, yes. because low productivity is normally came from the small land holders not from not from the big palm oil company so on your last few slides you mentioned a lot of like potential opportunities to tackle the deforestation issue but the, is there any particular policy towards those small land holders okay thank you Yes, the small uh, landholders in this context, they are ones who are the supply chain, into the supply chain of the big corporate corporations. And we, uh, the, the, the national government, certainly can regulate the big companies and give them directions if the landholders is errant, is not disciplined, don't take their product with them. So, but on the other side, if they can have a, 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 have a budget for em, empowering the small landholders, small being maybe two hectares, five hectares, not small for like uh, uh, household uh, plants, but, but uh, they are going things, but they are 
one of the sources of emissions, actually. Uh, you, were, you were right in saying that it's actually not the big corporations because, because the big corporations did do that uh, until maybe five years ago, and most of them are in jail now. So now they're clear, but this, we cannot uh, uh, jail 15,000 landholders. Can, so we have to educate and give them power to be more friendly to the environment. So that's what we're trying to do. And this also has a, we are, uh, uh, we are um, endorsing the big corporation to use their CSR for that purpose so they can survive, but also at the same time, they can, uh, well, they can give uh, the small and others a good living. Thank you for the question. Pak Rakmat, thank you again. Uh, you've always been so warm and welcoming to, to uh, University of Maryland students and myself in Indonesia. I hope we've been able to okay. do the same in return. Thank you.